uh, we were Inc. Inc. Uh, uh, 500. We were 28th on the Inc. 500. Uh, fastest growing company in Missouri history. Um, was making real money and uh, married, beautiful wife, didn't have any kids yet, and just felt completely empty. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green, and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times bestselling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son, Troy, each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. Brent Bishore is the founder of Permanent Equity, a private equity firm that cares about what happens next. After sort of stumbling into entrepreneurship, Brent found himself running two very successful companies and used that foundation to launch his holding company. 15 companies and $350 million of outside capital. Later, we get today's version of permanent equity. Brent is much more than just an entrepreneur, though, and opens up about his personal growth outside of business on today's episode. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Brent Bishore, it is an honor to have you on our podcast today. I know that you are the CEO and founder of Permanent Equity, a unique private equity fund in many ways, such as you never incur debt. Do you mind if I also call you the darling on the internet on the subject of buying small businesses and how to become a multimillionaire with no formal training in finance? Most importantly, you are also the father of three beautiful girls. And Troy tells me that recently you added a baby boy to the mix. Congratulations. Thank you. That's probably the best, uh, best intro I've ever had. Look at that. You sent me the money to make sure he had the read in with all, I mean, there was incentives built in that if he hit certain points, I got all the upwards adjusters built in there. In the That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Here's the $20. Yeah. <laughs> well, I do write a lot of fiction. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's written four, over 40 now fiction books, Brad, so he's got you. It's, that's the perfect reading. <laughs> that's amazing. That may be the best piece of fiction you've ever written. It seems that everyone wants to pick your brain on how to get rich. You are such an unassuming guy. I think people hear you and they think, yeah, I could do that. We'll ask you about that in a few minutes, but we're interested in the man behind the mask. So let's start with your childhood. What kind of kid were you? Interests, siblings, parents, teachers? That's a great question. Yeah, I grew up in Joplin, Missouri. Uh, my mom was a uh, English professor. My dad uh, worked in the same company in government relations and government sales for, gosh, I think it was 39 years. Um, so I have a brother uh, who's three and a half years younger. What kind of kid was I? That's a great question. I was uh, played a lot of sports, was always curious. Uh, I, I always liked starting things. I think I, I, uh, I think it was probably seven or eight years old and I started a uh, bow and arrow business, made, made custom bow and arrows. Didn't, didn't go great. Um, but uh, no, I had a, I, in many ways, I had a really good childhood. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm grateful. Grateful for it. Uh, grateful for Joplin. Had a um, really went to a really great school down there um, uh, called Thomas Jefferson Independent Day School. Started doing that when I was in fifth grade, and um, yeah, it was wonderful. Had had great teachers, and I mean, really got an incredible education. Um, it, uh, I what you know, you're never quite sure. Being from Joplin, Missouri, you're never quite sure what, how you how you stack up. And I ended up going to a school on the East Coast for for undergraduate called Washington and Lee, and. Uh, there were a bunch of you know kids from from pretty elite schools that that went there, and 
I hung okay with them. So it was, uh, you know, clearly the proof in the pudding. So, yeah. What do you think? Uh, you mentioned starting the, the bow and arrow business, which is a hilarious first business. But uh, what do you think got you into that? Is there entrepreneurial influences at home or people you looked up to? Or was it just kind of inside you? Yeah, no, I, I mean, my parents weren't entrepreneurial. Um, uh, you know, it was just, it was one of those things that I just always loved, like creating and trying new things and um, trying to, uh, um, trying to, you know, I don't know, just be curious about how the world works. And so I got curious about uh, bows and arrows. And then I, I got curious about uh, uh, playing cards, uh, like basketball cards. I love basketball growing up. And so I was, got into basketball cards and I would go to like basketball sh- uh, trading shows or whatever and and uh, would try to buy low and sell high. Uh, you know, it's kind of like the, uh, you know, trading operation. So enjoyed that. Um I don't know. Just always just kind of, you know, I always was given the, the freedom. Uh, my grandmother was a huge influence on me. She would take me around and we kind of do all kinds of things together and just play around. I had, I had quite a, uh, quite a wild childhood at her house. We would call it Camp Nana. And she was, uh, uh, the product of two French immigrants lived on land down in Southwest Missouri. And, um, her, you know, her idea of babysitting my brother and I when I was probably, you know, nine, 10, 11, you know, he was, three and a half years younger, which now looking back on having kids this age, I can't imagine, but she would just give us like a loaded handgun and matches and gasoline and, um, you know, tell us to, tell us to, to go have fun. And so, um, you know, we would get the uh, sheriff called on us, uh, you know, about once a month, we were on a first name basis and we'd blow stuff up and shoot turtles. And, you know, we used to go by and there was a, a firework stand that uh, sold year round. And so we'd go and buy like, you know, all kinds of fireworks. And then, uh, we'd also ask my grandmother for like gunpowder, you know, like when, when, a, when an 11 year old is asking for gunpowder, you should probably <laughs> not give it to them. <laughs> but, uh, my, my grandmother, bless her, she, she, she passed away about a year and a half ago. She was one of a kind. My, my parents had no idea what she was doing with us. And, uh, <laughs> and she would even tell us, she would say, um, she would say, Hey, look, here's the deal. If you tell your parents what's going down, game's over. And we'd be like, we wouldn't say a word. So. No more gunpowder and fireworks. Oh man. I mean, you know, as a, as a 10, 11 year old, she would, she would literally just like, we would go to Sam's and we'd buy like the cases of sour straws, you know, like the, the, the candies. And I would like eat an entire case of sour straws, like at her house. I mean, I was like jittery and I'd pass out, you know, I was like, like going to die, diabetic shock. Anyway, it was wild. Jittery, she was, jittery with a handgun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh man. Yeah, it was good. I, I got drunk uh, for the first time at her house when I was uh, nine years old. True story. Oh my God. That's wild. What was high school like for you and what were your aspirations at that time? Hmm. High school. Um, yeah. So I, um, I learned that I like to win and I like to be in charge of things. And so high school was uh, a, a pretty big display of that. So I, uh, see senior year, I was, I was president student body and captain of the tennis team and, um, editor in chief of the newspaper. And it was kind of, I did all the things and, um, that, that, I mean, uh, kind of led into college and, and into law and MBA and, and all of that as well. It kind of was, uh, it was a season of my life where, uh, I thought I'd be okay if I just achieved a lot and accomplished a lot and, uh, tried to work at it real hard for a long time. And, uh, some, some good things came out of it and some real emptiness and brokenness came out of that. You mentioned the, uh, you know, the, the starting the businesses earlier and you saw like the trading cards Did that carry on is that high school stuff you did too, or was, did you evolve and do different stuff in high school? Yeah, mostly high school. The focus was on just getting into a good, good undergraduate school. And, uh, I really enjoyed playing sports. And so it was just kind of a combination of sports and, uh, sports and girls and, and college, uh, trying to get into college. And so yeah, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't do really anything entrepreneurial until I was in, uh, law school. And then you did, uh, you also just mentioned like the, you know, you talked about the hard work trying to get into school. And there was like that feeling of emptiness, I think is what you said. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's a lot of things. That's a lot, not a lot of things. That's what a lot of people feel when they're chasing those things. And they're expecting that once they get the next accomplishment, that it'll finally, you know, finally be there. But 
Um, a mutual friend of ours, Andrew Wilkinson, when I, we were at your uh, event there, uh, Main Street Summit in, in Missouri, uh, he was talking to me about his book coming out, Never Enough, where he talks about that. He's, ch- he's been chasing that feeling since, I think he has it since like whatever, middle school, and it's just never enough and always feels that uh, kind of emptiness like you mentioned. Yeah, I mean, for me, I can I can certainly relate. I mean, I um, I knew I wasn't okay. I knew that I wasn't enough, and um, you know, a way that I was able to control my environment around me was if I was able to achieve and perform. Uh, it seemed to make people happy, and it seemed to kind of make that feeling go away. And so, I'd wake up uh, every day, and I'd say this lasted well into my even thirties. Wake up every day with sort of sweaty palms and. Uh, see what the world wanted from me and try to give it to them. And, and, you know, I would call that my false self. Um, and the world really likes my false self. Like I get a lot done. My false self is, is, uh, uh, sparkly and, uh, is, uh, high achieving and high performing. And, um, yeah, I really got a taste of that in high school. I mean, you know, you win tennis matches, you become the best in your area to sport. You, uh, you know, get elected to the, highest office in your high school looking back on it, it felt like such a big deal uh obviously it, it wasn't but um these are all the things that you know um at the time it was prestige games and i think that you know that the desire to play prestige games uh the, the you know i would call like worldly games um you know certainly it, that desire doesn't change uh it's just the what the games are changes and so the game was a little bit different in college it was a little bit different in law and mba then was different once i got into my own and started trying to be in business and so um yeah but that's a treadmill that you know i would say the peak of that treadmill for me hit in 2000 let's see here 2009 2010 uh we were in Inc. Uh, uh, 500. We were 28th on the Inc. 500. Uh, fastest growing company in Missouri history. Um, was making real money and uh, married, beautiful wife, didn't have any kids yet and just felt completely empty. And uh, that was, that was a big, that was a big shift in my life. That was when uh, the Lord came calling and um, yeah, everything changed. What about college? I know you didn't have any formal training in finance, but what was your major? Did you take any business courses? What did you think you were going to do? Also, um, during this time, did you have a mentor? Yeah, great questions. Uh, so I uh, went to school at a, a tiny university in Virginia called Washington and Lee. And I picked it because, uh, Tim, you for sure remember this. I don't know, if Troy, if you do, but the Barnes & Noble, you used to be able to go into these bookshops, Books a Million, Barnes & Noble, and they used to have these college books that were like, you know, that thick of, you know, all the top universities. And they used to rank them on these criteria. And I remember um, triangulating around Washington Lee because it was uh, the most difficult academically in the country my junior year in high school. It was uh, the number two party school in the country, and it produced the most presidents and CEOs of any school in the country. And I figured, you know, those seem like three things to triangulate around. So uh, I applied to one school, got in, uh, and uh, and ended up going there. Beautiful school, great school, unbelievable academics, um, and one heck of a party scene, might I add. I uh, was in a fraternity there, uh, lived in the frat house for three years. Um, I think I was the only the only guy in my class to do that all three years. Uh, and um, yeah, it was a great experience. I mean, it was it was uh, uh, my my major was politics with an emphasis in poverty studies. So I actually have a minor in, in, in poverty studies. So nothing to do with, with business. Um, although the politics program was located in what's called the C school, the commerce school at Washington Lee. So we had to take some prerequisites in like economics, micro macro economics. Um, but yeah, I mean, I finished with my major at the end of my sophomore year, I came in with some credits. So, um, I basically majored in college the last two years and, uh, got to, the, the person who led the Shepherd Poverty Program, where I got the minor, uh, his name's Harlan Beckley. And uh, he became a real mentor to me. So I spent a lot of time with Harlan. And he, um, just a kind, generous, gentle man, and um, uh, made a huge impact on on sort of how I, how I thought about the world. So um, yeah, college was a great experience. So then you graduate from college. And what was your first job out of school? Yeah, my first job was starting my own business. Um, 
out of school. So, I mean, I had jobs growing up uh, here and there, uh, just kind of odds and ends type stuff. How old were you when you did this? And what gave you the confidence to do it? Yeah, I was, let's see here. So I bought the business in 2000, early 2010, late 2009, early 2010. So I was uh, 26, 27 at the time that I bought it. And uh, what gave me the confidence, I would say it was stupidity. Uh, looking back on it, it was, it was, it was pure dumb luck. I mean, I, I've said this before, but it's like, I remember my lawyer at the time, I was like, you know, so what do we do? And he's like, Oh, we got to do diligence. So I literally typed into Google D O diligence. Um, I had no idea what it was. And I was like, Oh, we just ask questions. Like I can do that. Um, you know, I would often would be negotiating points. I'd, I'd just be Googling the heck. I basically, I owe most of my career to Google is, is what it really comes down to. Um, and, uh, just learned on the fly and, um, you know, Lord works it out. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. Uh, it was, it was, uh, in many ways, dumb luck. Um, I had some skills. I had, you know, God's given me some gifts that I, um, some talents that I am, uh, I, I would be totally screwed if I had lived in like the 1700s, but my skills are more valued, uh, today. So, uh, grateful that I wasn't born in the 1700s. <laughs> I know you took out an SBA loan on your first deal. Can you tell everyone what that is, how you can get one, and how you yourself came up with that first 20%? Yeah, so uh, SBA loans is a small business administration loan. Um, they're designed for people who um, want to go and acquire um, you know, small businesses. And so it was perfectly designed for somebody like me. Um, you know, I had built up in the previous business, um, you know, the business I'd started, I'd built up uh, working capital. And so I was able to get sort of a working capital line of credit, uh, was able to leverage that, put in the, put in the, uh, uh, put in the 20%. And then, yeah, you're able to get, you know, sort of 80%, uh, on the, uh, from the government, uh, in a, you know, 10 year fixed note. I think the program's actually changed now. I think you can actually get 90% now, uh, through the SBA last time I checked. And it's up to, it used to be up to $5 million. It may have moved a little bit higher. And the USDA has a similar program, which is basically the same program, but for rural businesses, that's up to 10 million, actually. So it's a little bit larger. Um, but yeah, you have to personally guarantee it. And so it's a 10 year fixed loan, um, a little bit higher interest rate. And, um, it worked out great for, for me. I mean, I would say, yeah, I always tell people, I, I get this quite often. People are like, well, should I launch a search fund or should I, you know, buy a business with an SBA loan? I'm like, it just depends on how confident you are and your risk, risk, you know, preferences. Um, I was an idiot and I didn't know what risk I was taking. Uh, and so I took it and it worked. And, uh, that's good. That's better than the alternative. And so, um, you know, the more people want to, want to bet on luck like me, uh, the more you should do that. And the more confident you are that you have the skills, the more you should do that. Um, otherwise it can be, can be challenging. And I've actually had, uh, three or four people now that have bought businesses, uh, with SBA loans who have, who I've chatted with, who unfortunately went bankrupt. Um, friend actually, I'm going to text to talk to you later today. Uh, he just went bankrupt, uh, after buying a business with an SBA loan. So it doesn't always work out well. Uh, and it's a pretty, uh, it's a fairly bifurcated outcome. Uh, let's put it that way. So, you're up and running your own business, or are you not running the day-to-day -day operations? If you were personally running it, how many businesses did you own before you had to step back and take more of the overseer and acquisition role? Yeah, it's a great question. So I would say when I was 24 to 26, 27, I was definitely in the full-time working in the business route. I mean, I was basically the creative director for uh, an agency is the way to just the best way to describe. It. So we were doing TV commercials. I mean, I was literally sitting down and writing scripts, certainly hiring people around me who were far more talented than me that could do it. But I was, I was sort of the catch all ham and egg. And, um, when I bought the business in St. Louis, Media Cross, uh, it really forced me to step out of the day to day operations. Um, and I was able to backfill those positions. So fairly early in my career, I was forced to, uh, um, step into more of an overseer type role. And, um, look, every transition is hard. I mean, um, 
you know, I was still, still fairly active. I drove to St. Louis, uh, gosh, four days a week, back and forth, you know, almost two hours. So each way for nine ish months, because that was the promise I made my wife. She was like, we just got married and now you're going to be in St. Louis a lot. And like, are we moving to St. Louis? Are we staying here? And I said, no, why don't we stay here? We have a house here. I'll just drive. And so, um, I did that for quite a while and then eventually, um, promoted somebody from within there and, um, step up and out of it. And then that gave me the freedom to really explore, okay, how are we going to, um, yeah, how are we going to try to be world-class at something? And I was, uh, initially attracted to, uh, venture capital and kind of the startup route, startup kind of ecosystem. Um, realized I wasn't going to be the best in the world at that from Columbia, Missouri. Uh, and then at the time there were just that many people that were, uh, buying small businesses and talking about them publicly. There was, you know, there's really no, no public, um, discussion on the topic back then. And so, uh, I figured, well, uh, seems like a riper space to step into. And I think we can be good at it. And that was the path we chose. Started going down that path. When you started helping out with the St. Louis business, did you promote somebody from within at your, at your agency? Yeah, I did for sure. Was it, were both of those, the promotions from within the agency and the St. Louis business, were they, you know, was it obvious or did you have to go through kind of a process there? Um, well, yeah, I mean, it was obvious at the time and then, uh, neither of the people who I put in charge ended up ultimately working out for, for a tremendously long period of time. And so, um, you know, I think it's like anything, you know, people change, situations change, the needs of the business change. And so, um, try to be, uh, kind and generous in how we do that, but we try to, you know, make sure that the right people, it's not healthy for people to be in the wrong seat and, and in responsibilities that they can't succeed in. So, um, you know, was able to successfully navigate that, you know, quite a few times now. I mean, look, owned the business in St. Louis for you know, pushing 15 years now. So it's been, been quite a long time. At what point did you start getting recognized for doing something out of the ordinary? Was it when you formed permanent equity? And would you describe permanent equity as the non-private equity, private equity fund? That's a great question. Yeah. When did we get, uh, start to get recognized? I think it was, you know, we made the Inc. 500 in 2010, 2009, 2010. Um, that was, uh, that was when people started taking notice, got invited to the White House. Um, kind of once you win one award, it's kind of weird. You win a whole bunch more awards. It's the availability principle. Um, so, you know, you start getting invited to things and all of a sudden you start to get to know other people and you, those people invite you to things and just kind of like a, it's, it's the same way that works everywhere. It's just, you know, different, different pockets of people. Um, yeah. And so, um, I would say that was kind of when we started getting recognized. And then, yeah, originally the firm was called adventures, uh, because I loved the name and I thought it was an adventure, what we were doing. Um, we ended up buying what's called the hack domain. So the shortest domain for the name, which is a D V E N T U R dot E S. If you think about it, it was about the dumbest branding decision you can ever make. Um, because people thought we were a Spanish travel company. And, uh, you know, our, our target audience was like, let's call it, you know, older men are typically the people who are selling us businesses. And so I don't know how many times, you know, people would be like, Hey, I sent you an email. And I'd be like, I never got it. And they're like, well, I put it in adventure.es.com. And I'm like, no, 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 there's no dot com at the end. It's just adventures. And they're like, what? There's no dot com. We'd be like, no, 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 just so it's adventure.com and i'm like no no no. there's there's actually there's no dot com as part of it and and i mean people were so confused and anyway uh we finally uh wised up and changed the name to permanent equity uh down the road which is much more indicative of who we are and what we do and the ethos that we have but um i was too clever for my own good which is a common theme in my life <laughs> how did uh where did permanent equities come from was it just thought of or was there any story behind that yeah it was actually um i remember when i first met patrick o'shaughnessy who uh he ended up he and his father led the first investment outside investment in in what we you know what now is called permanent equity um it really without them we wouldn't have uh we wouldn't have raised the funds and so i remember the first time i met with him he was like well how do you describe what you're doing and i was like really it's permanent equity it's a it's a new style of private equity 
Um, in many ways, it's the opposite of private equity. And lo and behold, he didn't even tell me about this. He bought permanentequity.com that night and uh, held on to it. And so he told me about it. I can't remember how many probably two or three years afterwards, he told me about it. And I was like, Oh, that's really cool. Like, awesome. And then I, I, when I went back to him, I was like, you know, Hey, we've been looking at changing our name. Um, I think we're going to change it to permanent equity. Can I have that domain? And he was like, yeah, sure. No problem. <laughs> so he just gave it to me. And anyway, uh, that's what friends are for, right? To, to see things that you don't see and then to uh, give you domains that they bought on your behalf years later. <laughs> Dan, I just, it's funny, Brent, you bring up uh, Patrick O'Shaughnessy because I just told you about him this weekend, I told you about the, the guy that in his podcast says, uh, what's the kindest thing anyone's ever done from you, for you? I was saying, literally just talked about it two days ago. I was saying that's like such a powerful question. Anyway. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's so funny. I can remember when Patrick uh, was like telling me, he's like, yeah, I think I'm going to start a podcast. And I was like, really? A podcast? This is a little late to start a podcast. And he was like, yeah, I'm sure no one will listen to it. But he's like, hey, will you come on? Will you be one of my first guests? I'm like, oh, fine. I'll do a favor for a friend. And ends up being like, you know, the most popular podcast in all of finance. So, you know, go figure. I obviously don't have a very good track record of picking trends. So <laughs> in exchange for a domain, you, 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 had, you were the guest. Exactly. That's exactly right. At what point in this story did you meet your lovely wife? And how did you two meet? Oh, man. Yeah. So we met in grad school. So she was getting her PhD. She was the one hot girl in the in the hard sciences, um, which was super sexy to me. I actually called her the sexy scientist for a year before I asked her out. Um, so my, finally, my buddies were like, look, you got to ask her out, man. Uh, we met in uh, we're like the nerdiest. I tell people we met in a bar because it's so embarrassing how we actually met. Uh, we, we, we met in graduate student government. So we were both those people who were like the, the king of the nerds. Uh, my wife and I are both king of the nerds. So we met in graduate student government. She thought I was crazy and uh, I thought she was hot. And, you know, it all worked out. So <laughs> good combo. I try to witness for Jesus in every podcast because it's become part of my faith. Since I was diagnosed with ALS, I had to make sense of it all. And I did. If I could live by faith as a Christian, witnessing for Christ in my condition, living my best life, relishing the blessings I have, celebrating each day as a gift, then maybe, just maybe, someone seeing me reduced to the antithesis of what I was physically, but being kind, strong, and joyful might be inspired enough to say to themselves, my situation isn't as bad as that guy. I've got to get some of what he's got, and it's free. Well, one thing too, I want to clarify though, you were just because it, I know you know this, but just to clarify for Brent and anybody listening, you were religious before you got diagnosed, but you did, it did, it definitely, um, you definitely raised the bar. I'd say. That's wonderful. I am fascinated by your conversion from atheism to Christianity. Was there some event or person that prompted this introspection? Could you describe the process to us? Yeah, thanks for asking. It's um uh, it's interesting cuz my my business career and my faith all uh all are intertwined. Uh I was a I was a hardcore atheist in my 20s. I grew up in uh, uh a PC USA church. Um we kind of went I would say one out of every two or three Sundays. My dad was a deacon at one point. Um I just, you know, I I'm I'm sure I heard the gospel a lot. I, I'd never heard it though. I still remember the first time I heard the gospel. I can relate to them when they get, they win that big prize and, uh, they feel empty inside. And that's how I felt. Um, and it was about that time that I started meeting people who were, um, different. They just were different. They lived with this freedom and lightness and joy in their lives. And I kept asking them, like, who are you? And what, why do you live like that? And they were like, Oh, I follow Jesus. And I was like, you got to be freaking kidding me. That's not at all what I wanted to hear. Um, and I got challenged. Um, they started taking me to lunch, um, had some, you know, some mentors along the way who really took me under their wing. I got invited to a small group. Um, and people were really challenging to me. People who were intelligent. They were way more intelligent than me, way more well read and way more thoughtful than me. And it really challenged my ideas of, of, you know, who is Jesus and, uh, what is this? And, and, um, I just started reading, exploring, and really had to get to the bottom of it. And um, I thought I was going to get to the bottom of it to show them all that uh, they were idiots and I was super smart. And turns out, uh, well, I think it was G.K. Chesterton who said, a young man 
uh, who's an atheist can't be too careful what he reads because it, it might change his life. And uh, that's exactly what happened to me. Um, I started reading and exploring and um, I was challenged to uh, ultimately pray as if God was real and ask him to reveal himself. And, and I did. And, and ultimately he did. And, um, you know, now I've seen a lot. Now I've been walking uh, in the faith for uh, 10 years and the transformation of my life is just, it, it's, uh, it's been remarkable and, and nothing that I've earned. It's just happened to me, uh, which is the beauty of grace. There's a lot of, so first of all, it's really long and, and well-spoken, but there's a bunch of questions that popped up in my head. So I got to, I'm going to go yeah. out of order though. Fire away. So you, you said that, you know, you, you asked God to reveal himself and he did. What, so I'm just thinking for the, you and I talked about this, uh, in person again at your, at your conference. But if I heard that, the first thing that comes to my mind, if I'm a listener is what does that mean? Because I think a lot of people are looking for that moment or searching for that moment but never experienced or haven't experienced it yet, I should say. So what is, what does that mean, you know, to you? I know it's a very personal thing, but if you don't mind sharing. Yeah, I can remember. I mean, I, so I was challenged that, you know, uh, somebody asked me like, have you ever prayed to God as if he's real and asked him to reveal himself? And I was like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sure. And then they were like, really? And I was like, no, actually, no, I've never done that before. And, uh, they were like, well, why don't you, why don't you start there? And I was like, yeah, sure. Great. And it was like three or four days later. And I can remember, um, I was alone in my house. I was bored. There was nothing to do. And I felt this call to like pray. And so, I mean, I'm sure it was like the meet the parents prayer. Right. But like, I got, you know, I got on my, I remember getting on my knees and being like, God, I don't know. I feel, I feel pulled towards something. I don't know what it is. I don't know if you're real. If you're not real, well, I guess I'll know because nothing will happen. But if you are real, like, will you reveal yourself? And there's just something that shifted inside of me just in, in that moment. And it wasn't like this, like, you know, heavens opened up and light came down or anything like that, but something shifted. And then all of a sudden I started being progressively more and more challenged by people around me. I started being more open to it. And for me, I had such a strong, uh, grip on, uh, atheism. And I just did not understand how, I mean, I can't remember what I had for lunch yesterday. Right? How in the world was I going to be able to know what happened two thousand years ago, four thousand years ago, um, and was it reliable? And I had all these questions. I hadn't studied this stuff, right? So I had to get to the root and like really understand how do we know what we know, and and has is the Bible been the same the whole way through, and is it just you know sort of a work of modern you know thinking and theory that we think the way that we think now, and was it different before? And so I had all these questions that were swirling around in my head. And why did God care so much about shellfish and if your ox and your donkey were hitched together and, you know, all this stuff, why did God care so much? Like the God of the universe cares about like who I have sex with. Like, why, why does that matter? Right. I mean, there's all these things that, um, were, were swirling around my head, but I can tell you that the more time I spent, uh, reading and learning and just trying to understand. And again, this was not coming from a position of faith. This was coming from a position of challenge where I felt challenged by the lives of the people that I saw that my life wasn't measuring up to theirs and their life w was way better. And my circumstances were often better than theirs. I mean, Tim, you said this, it's, it's beautiful what you said, you know, if people could look at you and say, Hey, I'm Tim's living his best life with this faith, right? Like maybe other people could say, well, maybe my life, I want that too. Right. It's the aroma of Christ. That's exactly what happened to me. And I think that's what happens with everyone is um, ultimately there's not enough knowledge in this world. It's going to move you one direction or the other ultimately it comes down to God revealing himself. And I mean, the, the faith background that I come out of the theology that I have, um, says it's all grace. So God calls us. And, um, I think that, you know, if you knock the door will be opened and it's this beautiful paradox. We can't understand how it works, but, um, I, the thing I challenge people with is if you don't understand what you're saying no to, Maybe understand that first. I mean, there's only one person in the history of the world that's ever claimed to be God and impacted the world that the way Jesus did. A lot of people claim to be God who've ridden off in the sunset. No one knows who they are. And um, there's a lot of people who've impacted the world, but there's not been another person who's claimed to be God and impacted the world. And so, um, you know, there's a reason why billions and billions of people, uh, more people on earth today worship Jesus than any other time in the history and a bigger percentage of people in the, in the world worship Jesus. And there's a, there's a reason behind it. And so, um, maybe she gets the bottom of that. And, and ultimately I think that Jesus will reveal himself. So 
It's been beautiful. Yeah, that's great. I remember uh, you and I were talking about this. You gave me some book. You said you read thirty something books to get to the, you know to to get to where you were comfortable with it. And I said, Brent, I'm not reading thirty something books. You got to give me your top three. And I actually got I got one of them right here. But I've got uh, oh there you go. I got, the three, I got the three of them. So my dad my dad doesn't need any any. Uh, not convincing is not the right word. My dad doesn't need any ex- exploration, but he's doing it with me. So he he just we just did uh, making sense of God by Timothy Keller. And anyways, yeah, that was it's got some challenge in it, doesn't it? What did you think yeah. of it, Troy? I, I think it was. First of all, I think it's really good. I mean, it's very very well written. It's it's written, I think, to argue against most of it. I should say not all of it, but a lot of it's written against like atheism, which I'm yeah. not. I don't feel like I'm there. I. I not to make it, make it about me, but I feel I'm... Let's go I there. Like, Come on. Yeah. Troy, you're on the hot seat now. Come on. That's right. You know what? Uh, Dad, disconnect. I'm, I'm taking over from here. <laughs> I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, basically, I feel, like, I feel like I know that there's a God. I, I had mm. like, when I was younger, you know, I feel like your teens are kind of made for atheism where you're like questioning everything and nothing's real and kind of, kind of what you talked about. Um, and now I feel like I know there is, but... My mom's Jewish. My dad's Christian. I kind of never picked a camp. I've got a foot on both on both skis, right? And uh, I don't know. I, I just don't. I don't know what the next step is after that. And I think you and I talked about it, and that's why I got these three books. And I don't. I feel like um, personally, a lot of people with religion, they're told, and you two guys are are examples against what I'm going to say. So I'm in ba- saying it's a bad company, but. A lot of people, they're told from their, when they're born, you're Jewish, you're Christian, you're Muslim, you're whatever. And then that's what they are for their whole life. And they never really try to question it or try to really push against it critically. I think people, like I said, maybe through teen, um, you know, angst or whatever it is, they push back a little bit. But I mean, like really dig in and, and push back or really, you know, I, I'll talk in, uh, about my dad like he's not here. I think if I had ALS, I mean, my dad's had a lot of, we, we jokingly say he's lived like three or four lives um, with all the different you know, NFL, number one New York Times bestseller, lawyer, TV, blah, 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 all that stuff. And I didn't even know he had a job till I was in uh, fifth or sixth grade. I thought, because my dad played in the NFL, I thought we were living off money from the NFL. And that's a, this is a funny story. I'll go on a, a, a side note quick. So I was playing Madden geez, I don't know, 2004 or something like that. And you could switch into this mode and play as like the all-time best teams for each franchise. And so the all-time Falcons, there was a number 99, which is my dad's number. They said he was from Syracuse, which is where my dad is from. And uh, at that time, in the game, like 2004, 2005, it, it estimated that the salary was significantly higher than it really was. It's because when my, my dad played in the 80s and 90s. So he was giving me a 2005 first round draft pick salary. And so I said to my parents, I'm like, man, I just saw the number on this Madden. Like, I, like it's factual. I'm like, I just yeah. saw the number on Madden. We're, we're, this is pretty good. And my dad's like, that number is not real. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, I didn't even know he had a job. I used to, my dad used to be, you know, the, I'd be in elementary school. They're like, a, you know, a kid, so, someone's parent wants to come in, is coming in to read to us today. And I'd look at the door and my dad walking be like, come on, man, you got to have something else to do. He'd coach all my sports teams. He goes, so like, again, considering all the stuff he's achieved, right? And I didn't even know he had a job. And, um, you know, to get ALS is such a, depending on, from, from my, I'll, I'll quote Timothy Keller here, from a finite human mind, it's just so unfair. And I feel like to me, and, and my dad doesn't feel that way, but to me, I'm like, Man, that's how, how does that not make you question faith and question religion and question the whole thing? And, um, you know, but a lot of times you see people like it happen to my dad it actually brings them closer, not further away. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of and that's you and I spoke about this in person a little bit. But I don't I'm definitely not uh, atheist, but I don't know where I'm like, I'm a, I'm a lost sheep here. I got a foot in two camps and I haven't made a choice, you know, made a choice like I'm a, like I'm being drafted. I just, I just yeah. don't really know. So I'm, just, I'm trying to search and and learn. I think that's beautiful, though. And 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 by the way, like, um, 
Yeah, I, I, this, so much of what you just said resonates with me. I mean, I went through a period of time where I was, uh, I was not an atheist anymore, but I certainly wasn't following Jesus. And, um, I think that's where I'd gotten myself in this mindset of like, well, all religions are kind of the same. And, you know, people, you know, get born into religion and, um, you know, C.S. Lewis has this great quote. He says, a little Christianity is, a, is an inoculation against Christ. And I think that's true that like people, you get so over familiarized with the stories that the, true historicity of it and the power of it it just gets lost in translation so i just encourage you keep keep researching keep keep doing your work you'll be okay i'm not i'm not too worried about it it's the people who give up the people i think who are farthest from god are kind of indifferent um actually uh, the people who are really fervently atheist to me are actually pretty close to uh, much closer to the faith than people i have a friend who i love him to death but he's like i don't need god uh i don't need any of that stuff like i've got a great life I'm fine. I'm all good. It's like, those are the people who are really far away from God, the self-reliant. So just keep searching. Yeah. And that's so, so part of this podcast, I, I had to convince my dad to do it. He originally told me no way. And I, and uh, then he said, he came back with some stipulations. He, he became the talent and I had to negotiate him in. And one of his stipulations was he had to talk about religion each episode. He was in his, he built in the contract. <laughs> I love it. Contract. <laughs> Great work, Tim. Way to negotiate hard. Brent, I got one more question, then we can move on. You, you mentioned it's just such a powerful thing. Um, again, I, I didn't know that part of the story, but I saw you in person interact with your wife, with your kids, and you guys couldn't seem closer. Obviously, everyone relationships have ups and downs, but you mentioned um, you know, telling her you didn't love her and your friends you didn't you know like and want to be around them. That's obviously you know, just about as low a place as you can get personally. So, you know, where do you go from there? Did she push you towards religion? Was she religious? Um, and say, you know, Hey, you're only feeling this way because you're missing something or how did that all happen? Yeah. So my, my, my wife was, uh, uh she, there's no reason she should have married me. I was, uh, as our, one of the pastors in our church calls us, this is the, the first time he's ever seen missionary dating work out. Uh, and so I, uh, it, it was horrible. I mean, we, we almost got divorced multiple times. Um, I was a terrible husband. I mean, I, I had all of the, what I would say I was deeply steeped in the cultural norms, which was, Hey, if she's there to serve me. Uh, if I meet her needs and she meets my needs and, uh, but it's all about what you can get out of a marriage. And um, it's the opposite of how uh, a marriage that's centered on on God works, um, a covenantal relationship. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I uh, we, we've had a lot of ups and downs through the years. There's a lot of uh, hurt that we cause each other. Uh, I'm certainly responsible for more than my fair share of it. Um, and, um, you know, I give her a lot of credit. She, she, you know, she prayed for me. She was patient with me. Um, we, we've been through a lot and now we have a relationship that, uh, is forged by fire. Um, there's no other way you can get, you can get to the, the depth that we have now without having a lot of trials. And so, um, certainly not perfect. We have our challenges and, and, uh, squabbles from time to time, but, but yeah, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just incredibly blessed by the relationship that I have now. By the way, I love how you witness for Jesus on your ex account. It's just beautiful. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate that. I'm just trying to trying to honor the uh, gifts that God's given me to steward. So you calling it X when I still call it Twitter makes me feel like I've got the gray hairs and you're the you're the young hipster. Hey, Tim's the talent. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Does scripture Matthew 1924 when Jesus says it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God concern you at all? Yes. <laughs> it should concern, uh, I think it should concern everyone. Yeah, so yes, the answer is, it, it, ultimately, we have to be concerned because it, it really begs the question, is it, are we operating for our kingdom or for the kingdom of God? I mean, those are the two questions. And so for me, I think about this a lot. Uh, I wake up, you know, most days and I forget I'm out of the story. I'm living in the wrong story. I'm living the story that the world tells me. And so um, I have to reorientate myself to uh, what is the true reality, uh, the upside down kingdom of God and, and, um, and live open handed and live uh, not for myself. And um, when I do live that way, it's beautiful. Uh, life is a symphony. 
And when I try to live for myself, uh, life becomes cold and dark and claustrophobic. And so it's just this beautiful dance that I get to get to go on uh, with Jesus. When you said you said a second ago, the upside down kingdom, what does that mean? Yeah, if you look, um, so if you look at the Beatitudes, uh, probably Jesus's most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, he talks about uh, who are blessed. And it looks like the opposite of who the world would call blessed are the ones who are blessed. So blessed are the poor, blessed are the poor in spirit. Um, blessed are those who are weeping. Blessed are those who are mourning. And the question is, why would he call them blessed? And what's the central thing that ties together all of them? All of them require a dependence on God. Like when I go to foreign countries, when I meet people who are in true poverty, you don't have to talk to them about God. They understand they're dependent. They're not, they're not under the illusion that they can control the world. Tim's not under the illusion that he can control the world, right? I mean, his body, his outward body is failing. It tells us in the, in the, in the gospels, he, you know, Jesus says, even though our bodies are failing, inwardly we're being renewed, right? Tim, you're a beautiful example of this. Outwardly, your body is failing, but inward you're being renewed. You can see it in your eyes. You can see it in the way you carry yourself. There's a renewal, an internal renewal. And so the upside down kingdom is living as if the world is superimposing. I mean, the world worships success and money and power and, and youth and beauty. It, it encourages us to use one another for our ends. Um, that is the inside out. That is the inverse of how Jesus talks about how, what the true reality of the kingdom is like. You know, the greatest among you will be a servant. I mean, Jesus is a prime example of that. I mean, the, if you believe it, let's just take it for a second and you say that, 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 that what, you know, Jesus was correct or what he was saying was true. The creator of the heavens and the earth, the creator of the trillions of galaxies condescended, came down and became a dependent child. I mean, that is ultimately dying on a cross alone, right? For the very people who put him there. I mean, it, it is a story unlike any other. It is a story that, that it doesn't make, uh, it's one of the things as I was reading the gospels, I remember for the first time, like really with new eyes, it was like, this does not make Christians look good. I mean, if you look at the Bible, it's filled with idiots and swindlers and deviants. I mean, it is, these are not um, the cleaned up, intelligent uh, people. And this is where I think, again, going back to the original question was, does it worry me that, that it says that it's easier for the camel to get through the eye of a needle than a rich man to heaven? Yes, because I think the rich in that context means whatever you think, rich in intelligence, rich financially, uh, blessed or rich in, in, in comfort. Um, those are the people who don't think they need God. That's why I call ALS a blessing. I'm glad that you will understand what I mean when I say that. Amen. 100 years from now, uh, when your great, great grandchildren are talking about you, what do you want them to remember? What do you hope they say? Yeah, I, um, I've attended a few funerals of people who I, I really respect. And um, the ones who I love the most, who I think I most highly of, they don't talk about the successes they had. They don't talk about the money they made or the companies they started. Um, they talk about the gentleness and kindness and generosity of the person. And so um, I think ultimately, and I'm getting kind of like teared up saying this, but like, I just want my, my kids, my grandkids uh, their kids t for me to be remembered as somebody who loved well, you know, who, who, um, was selfless, was not, was, was not incurved, was, was uh, unconcerned with myself and was, uh, had a heart of service and, and care. Brent B. Shore, it has been such a pleasure spending some time with you today. May God continue to bless you and your family. Thank you, Tim. It's been a real honor. Um, I, uh, I don't, I don't say this lightly. Um, it's a joy. I, I've been looking forward to doing this. And, you know, Troy, thank you so much for setting it up. Uh, to see the two of you interact, um, man, it's really such an encouragement. Tim, you, like I said, like I can just see that you're being renewed. Uh, you are uh, one of the strongest apologetics I've ever seen uh, for the power of, of God in somebody's life. And so, um, not that you need to hear it, but, but keep, keep going. Keep fighting the fight. Keep running the race. Brent, I got one more thing before my dad, the, the town always tries to cut me off before I can get this question before we end. Brent, one of the things that we try to do on each at the end of each episode is uh, 
we ask our guests who's somebody that we should have on to help tell their story. One of the things that's important to us is we didn't want to get boxed in as an ALS podcast, a religious podcast, an athlete's podcast, a writer's podcast. We wanted to make sure things were, you know, very wide and, and included all different kinds of uh, stories and people. So really, I always say to people, we're, we're looking for interesting people with interesting stories, um, you know, whatever that leads us to. And it's been uh, a pretty good adventure. Dot es so far. Well, I'll, <laughs> I'll ask Sick you. Burn. Yeah, <laughs> I'll ask you what. Uh, well, do you have anybody you think that we should have on here? Um, whether it's to tell their story to new people, or maybe their story's been told before, but just getting it out to our audience. Yeah, I would say my friends John and Ash Marsh in Opelika, Alabama. Um, they're dear, dear friends, and they have one of the most compelling stories I've ever heard in my life. Uh, they went from uh, fixing up junked cars and uh, having a terrible broken marriage, addiction, uh, affair, uh, horrible just brokenness. And now, uh, and this is the way God works, is God takes the worst we've been through uh, and by our wounds, we were able to heal other people. And now they run an incredible real estate business and they've reconciled over 220 marriages now. And, uh, it's the most, the most interesting people you've ever met. They're, they're wild. I love them so much. So yeah, they'd be great to have on. Happy to introduce you. Yeah, that'd be great. Awesome. As my dad said, thanks so much for the time and, and connecting with us today. Hey, thanks a lot. And I, uh, I appreciate again the patience with my apparently completely inept, uh, technology stack here. Tell them about our talk with Tony Evans. And we just, my dad, we just, uh, we just talked with Tony Evans, who's the, uh, Pretty famous Christian pastor. Oh yeah, too. I got to meet him last year. Oh, that's right. I think you did. I think you told me that. Yeah, Tony's amazing. What a character. Tony is a character. Yeah, he is. He was. Uh, he was unapologetic. That's for sure. <laughs> I love it. Well, I appreciate you guys so much, Tim. Thank you so much for being so talented. Thank you for helping get Troy the talent that he needs. I mean, the guy's in desperate need of talent, as you know. And so I'm glad that you can, glad you can raise the talent bar. You're doing a great job. Only one of us gets the talent contract. That's exactly right. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barkley Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional national, and global reach from our offices across the northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to BarclayDamon.com. I want to thank my partners at Barclay Damon for supporting this podcast and, of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to Tackle ALS. For cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital, if you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com.